OK, so we're going to um, go over chapter one. And your um, textbook is the blue and green color dental and Wolfell's dental anatomy. So um, hopefully you have that textbook now and we're able to read at least part of the chapter or if you didn't, you will this weekend probably. Um, there's a lot of objectives for this course, but they're pretty basic. So based on the location in the normal complete primary dentition name all 20 teeth, uh, based on the location in the normal complete permanent den dentition name all 32 teeth. Um, use the universal numbering system. Use the Palmer and International tooth numbering systems. Identify and describe the supportive structures of the teeth and periodontium. Identify and describe the four tissues of a tooth and their location, mineral content, and function. Differentiate an anatomic crown and root from a clinical crown and root. Name each tooth surface on anterior and posterior teeth. From all views, divide a tooth, crown, and root into thirds and label each. Define terms used to describe a specific dimension of a tooth. Describe and identify by name, common tooth rounded elevations, ridges, depressions, and grooves for each tooth type. Describe and recognize the parts of a root. Describe and identify the attributes of ideal tooth alignment and embrasure spaces relative to other teeth within the arch. Describe and identify the ideal interarch relationship of teeth in class one occlusion and identify the number of developmental, developmental lobes that form each tooth and recognize the anatomic landmarks of a tooth that form from these lobes. So that sounds like a lot of um, stuff to learn in one chapter. You are going to just touch on that in chapter one. It's not until we get through each of the chapters, you'll learn each of these things on the different types of teeth. Um, right now, we're just going to kind of learn some of the terms that you're going to use when we do get to those chapters, but um, eventually by the time we get finished with this class, you will be able to in detail describe the things that are listed here. So we're going to start with the naming the teeth. Those of you who have dental experience have probably um, are familiar with this. You have two sets of teeth. You have a primary dentition or baby teeth and you have your permanent dentition or secondary teeth or just permanent teeth. Your upper, upper teeth are called your maxillary teeth. Your lower teeth are your mandibular teeth. We divide your mouth into quadrants and this is pretty standard. So throughout dentistry, upper right is quadrant one, upper left is quadrant two. Then we jump down to the lower left is quadrant three or C, and then the lower right is quadrant four or D. When we do procedures, that's a standard um, numbering for the quadrants. When we do procedures, we do them usually starting in that sequence. We'll do upper right, upper left, lower left, lower right. Um, obviously that varies. When we do scaling and replaning, we do it by side because of the anesthesia. But as you're numbering teeth, as you're probing teeth, um, just know those quadrants and what numbers they are. There are three classes and functions of teeth. You have incisors, which incise or cut. Your incisors are your two front teeth on the top, are your um, central incisors. Your two next to them that look the same but are slightly smaller are your lateral incisors. And then the four on the bottom are your central and lateral incisors on the mandibular. They cut into food. That's what you use to bite. Your canines are for holding on. So they're like your tearing teeth. And most of the time you probably don't even notice this, but when you're doing something, eating something hard like a bagel or French bread, or you're trying to like tear something tough, um, most of the time, you'll kind of move over to where your canine is and use your canine to torque it rather than using your front teeth. Your canines have long roots, they're a big solid tooth, and they're perfect for tearing. And you all know from looking at animals, they have large canine, strong canine teeth. It's what they use when they're eating meat or tearing something apart um, in the wild. Um, so canines are an important tooth. 
And then you have premolars. Those are called your transitional teeth. They go between tearing and grinding. So your premolars kind of have a, a multi-purpose. They sit um, behind your canines. There's two in each quadrant. You have your first premolar, which is right next to your canine. And then you have your second premolars, which are right before your molars. And then of course, the last ones are your molars. Their purpose is to grind your food. So you cut or tear your food and it slowly works its way to the back and you chew and grind your food with your molars before you swallow it. Any questions? Okay, so we describe the teeth in the arch when we're talking about the teeth. So first we start with the dentition. It's either going to be primary or permanent. So most of the time when you're naming teeth, um, if we don't know anything about the patient, primary or permanent comes in handy. But when we're in like clinic or you're in private practice and you have a patient laying in your chair and the patient is clearly an adult, um, the naming them primary and permanent, there's an assumption they're permanent unless otherwise, like some people will have a retained primary tooth, so they never lost one of their primary teeth. Then you would use the word primary, but otherwise it's an assumption they're permanent teeth. On a child, most of the time you're going to have to say primary or permanent because we don't always know. Um, there's a pattern in a time period when children should be transitioning from their primary to their permanent dentition, but that varies among children. Um, then you, you're always going to use arch, maxillary, or mandibular. So if you're talking about an upper tooth, you're going to say the maxillary. If you're talking about a lower tooth, you're going to say the mandibular. The next word we're going to use is right or left. So we're going to identify which quadrant and which, um, whether it's right or left. So now if you were talking about a tooth up here, you would be saying maxillary right. And then we're going to get to the next part here. Then you're going to talk about the class of tooth. So there are four classes of teeth. There are incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. So next you would say the class of tooth. So if I was talking about a tooth up here, I would say maxillary, right, first molar, second molar, third molar. Um, if I was talking about this tooth right in the front, I would say it's the maxillary right incisor. And if there's more than one of that tooth type, you're going to use a descriptor. Do we mean central incisor or lateral incisor? Are we talking first molar, second molar, or third molar? So a tooth up here, you would say maxillary right first molar or maxillary right central incisor. Does that make sense to everybody? So does anybody want to take a chance at describing the tooth that's being pointed to by the blue arrow? Anybody? All right, so um, let's decide, is it a maxillary or mandibular? Mandibular. Okay, good, mandibular. Um, is it on the right or the left? The right. The right. Okay, so does everybody get why they chose right? Because we're talking about the patient, the patient's mouth. So if we're looking at this patient, it's going to kind of be opposite. So that's going to be their right side. I always, sometimes when I was first learning, I always had to look at their arm and decide like, is this the right hand? Is this their left hand? Or I kind of position my body. Is this the right or is this the left? Because, you know, when you're looking at them, it can get confusing pretty easily. Um, and then is that a central incisor, lateral incisor, canine? Lateral. Lateral, lateral good. So that would be considered the, oops, sorry. That would be considered the mandibular right lateral incisor is how you would describe that. So we have something called the universal numbering system that we use we have one for the primary <clears throat> dentition and one for the permanent dentition. So in the universal numbering system, the teeth um, 
a permanent dentition has 32 teeth, including the wisdom teeth. Each tooth is assigned a number. So we would start in the upper right, and the very back tooth would be a wisdom tooth, and that's tooth number one. And then we're going to count all the way around. Number two would be the second molar, number three would be the first molar, and then we're going to go all the way around, and so there'll be eight teeth in this quadrant, eight teeth in this quadrant, and then when we get to tooth number 16, we're going to drop down to the third molar on this side, and that's tooth number 17. And then we're going to continue to count across till we get over to the lower right. The very last tooth is tooth number 32. It is also a third molar. What I tell most students to do with that's easiest when you're numbering, when we have a quiz or a test, the first thing you want to do is draw a little arch and put Put the numbers in 1 through 16 on the top or maxillary then 17 through 32 down on the mandibular that way you will have the ability to kind of look at it rather than trying to count in your head so you just draw the little diagram of the arch and put the numbers in for purposes in clinic when you start um, using your instruments in the next week or so um, you're going to the easiest way to remember it is your wisdom teeth or your third molars are usually going to be absent. Most of you probably have had your third molars removed, right? So you still don't you those are still 1, 16, 17, and 32. We don't move over and start with number one being the first tooth you have present. So in other words, like tooth number two is your maxillary right second molar. That is always tooth number two. You could be missing all the rest of your teeth in your entire mouth, but that is still going to be tooth number two. And your maxillary right first molar is always going to be tooth number three. Does that make sense? So that's a pretty that's a pretty standard way to kind of remember it. It'll probably take you, if you don't have dental experience, it'll probably take you through like halfway through or most of the way through this term to where you can just sort of visualize and count the teeth and not write them down. So don't hesitate to write them down if you need to, even when you're doing your instrumentation and Professor Ramos is saying, I want you to scale tooth number three. You can count them out or count them on yourself. I commonly would see uh, people during quizzes putting their finger and counting. Of course, we don't want you putting your fingers in your mouth now, but counting their teeth as they went along through the quiz. I always knew what question they were on because I could see them counting their teeth. Um, so over time, you will memorize these, and as we break them down and go through them, it'll be easier to remember them. Anybody have questions? Okay. So the primary dentition has what we call the universal numbering system as well, but the primary dentition is done with letters of the alphabet. A primary dentition only has 20 teeth. So there's not as many to remember. They do not have premolars. The primary dentition only has incisors, canines, and molars. And they only have two molars in each quadrant, not three. So that's where you pick up teeth along the way. That's how you get from 20 to 32 when you become a permanent dentition person. So they start, they number them, they letter them, number them the same way. They start with the upper right um, second primary molar, primary second molar, and that would be A. And then they go B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So there's only five teeth in each quadrant instead of eight. And so when you get to the letter J, then you drop down to the lower left and you go K through T. Until you start working on a lot of primary dentitions, um, it takes time to learn those letters. Just 
you kind of have to consciously think about it. Again, for purposes of quizzes or tests, I would write them out. So that okay, when okay. you're... What's that? Just a quick question. Uh huh. When they go from primary to um, permanent dentition, do their molars turn into premolars or do their molar stay molars and then, you know what I mean? That's an excellent question. So um, their tiny little molars turn into premolars. Okay. And so, <coughs> excuse me, what happens with the child is when they're about six years old, somewhere in that range, they will start to get their first permanent molars. Their first permanent molars, tooth numbers 3, 14, 19, and 30, come in behind their primary dentition. So they don't lose any teeth or anything. These teeth just start coming in. And what you will commonly see is children will, just like when they're babies, they'll start teething again. They get cranky. They can get cranky. They can get irritable. They can suck on their fingers. Um, a lot of times parents are like, I don't know why they're doing that. They're six years old and now they're starting to suck on their fingers again because it hurts, you know, just like when they were getting their, ba their baby teeth, um, it hurts the gums. And a lot of parents are not aware that those are permanent teeth coming in behind their primary dentition because they didn't lose a tooth. So the parents aren't looking for a permanent tooth. And that's something you would want to educate your parents on when they bring in children in that age range is to make sure they're aware those are permanent teeth and now you have to brush farther back when you're helping your child brush their teeth. So in that respect, <clears throat> tooth B becomes tooth number five. Tooth B, one, two. I have to, th I have to count them too. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. So tooth A would fall out and become tooth number four and tooth B would fall out and become number five. And then right behind that at the back of the picture or at the back of the where those molars stop is where those permanent molars are going to come in. And as you know, so then a, a six year old would have 24 teeth in their mouth, not 20. Because they've picked up the four molars. Then when they turn when a child turns about 12 years old, usually by then they've lost all their primary teeth then their second molars come in behind the first molars so again they don't lose the tooth they just pick up four more teeth so a 12 or 13 year old would have 28 teeth in their mouth and then when you're in your teens or early 20s and your third molars or wisdom teeth are coming in those are the, they come in behind the second molars and those are the ones that, um, those are tooth numbers 29, 30, 31, and 32, not by number, but those are your last of your 32 teeth. Most people get those extracted, and so they have a 28 teeth in their dentition. So the Palmer numbering system is not used here in the United States very much. I think some orthodontic offices use it but we still have to be aware of it and know how to use it. So the Palmer numbering system uses brackets. So if you look down on the, ex on the example I drew, you would make a bracket. So in the picture where there's like a T shape, the upper right quadrant has a bracket around it and it's quadrant one. The upper left quadrant, quadrant two. The lower left quadrant, quadrant three, and the lower right is quadrant four, just like we talked about earlier. Then they number the teeth starting with the central incisor and go back. So the central incisors are number one on both the maxillary and the mandibular um, arch. The laterals are number two, canines are number three, first pre is number four, second pre is number five, and then your molars are six, seven, and eight in both arches. So you're just basically starting from one and numbering back. So in my example down there on the upper right, so they would draw the bracket that goes like this because you're looking at the right quadrant and then the number three would go inside of it. So that would be saying 
tooth upper right three, which is your upper right canine. If I wanted to, to describe an upper left tooth, um, I would go, it would be quadrant number two. And so then it would be, it would be the left bracket and a number three in it. Does that make sense? It's not one we commonly use, although I've heard, like I said, some orthodontist offices will use that. I think, hold on a second, I think somebody's trying to get into the meeting and I'm not sure how to, to do that. Okay, we're all good. Can you see this still? Yeah. Okay. All right. And so then there's the third one is called the International Tooth Numbering System. Um, this one is used um, worldwide. And um, I don't know if every country like uses it or if this was just established to be used worldwide. Like they might use something else in their private practices just like we do. In this one, um, uses two digits for each permanent or primary tooth. The first digit is denotes the specific quadrant, and the second digit is the tooth. So um, if you're looking at a permanent dentition, the maxillary right is one, left is two, mandibular left is three, and mandibular right is four, just like we know them. And then primary would be the same way, only this would be quadrant five, six, seven, and eight. So they have permanent and then the primary. And so then they go ahead and they number the teeth. So they're numbered one to eight with number one being the central incisor and they go all the way back, just like the Palmer system did. They go all the way back. So if I wanted to describe the upper right central incisor, it would be quadrant one, tooth number one. So I would write one, one. If I wanted to describe the upper left central, it would be two, one. Quadrant number two, tooth number one. To me, that seems very confusing, but apparently it's not because they use it. But um, so in this example, the permanent upper left maxillary canine would be in quadrant two and it would be tooth number three from the front. The, the one, um, once we get past this, believe it or not, there is this is on boards too, but once we get past this um, chapter and everything, we're always going to be using the universal numbering system. In clinic, that's what we use. In private practice, that's what you're going to use. For insurance companies, that's what you're going to use. So focus really hard on just learning the universal numbering system. Um, so then we have terminology that we use to describe the parts of a tooth. A tooth contains four tissues, enamel, dentin, cementum, and pulp. So the enamel on the tooth is the part of the tooth that you see on your in your mouth. Um, it covers 90, it's 95 percent calcium hydroxyapatite. Don't worry about that part right now. Um, that's what is enamel is made from. Enamel is extremely hard. Um, it's a nice surface for a tooth. The dentin um, is probably the biggest portion of the tooth. The dentin sits underneath the enamel. And it also coats the root. The root has an outer surface called cementum. So you've got enamel and cementum on the outside and the dentin runs underneath both of those surfaces, just like in the picture. And then you've got your pulp. Your pulp is um, non-mineralized connective tissue. Your pulp is where you get your sensory from. So in other words, if you get um, sensitivity to cold, pain, um, decay, the pulp runs down the middle of the tooth. Um, the pulp has on the end of it, if you look at that picture, the end is not sealed all the way closed. 
there's something called an apical foramen. Ap ap apical is the term apex, and we talked about an apex the other day in our terminology. Um, so that's the apex. And the foramen, somebody's trying to get in the meeting again here. Nope. Okay. And the apical foramen is the opening at the end. A foramen is a hole. And so the apical foramen is the hole at the end of the root. That allows blood supply and nerve supply to the tooth. So um, that's what gives the tooth its life or its vitality. Is It goes from the pulp, you know, in and out of the pulp. So it's not completely sealed closed. Um, and this next slide is a picture in slide 13 of the apical foramen. Um, when you need a root canal, when you hear people having a toothache and they need a root canal, the nerve is inside the pulp of the tooth. And so um, they go in through the top of the tooth and they take that nerve tissue out. Um, what has happened is uh, the nerve has actually died or is in the process of dying, usually be, um, due to trauma of some kind or decay. So you got hit in the mouth and by a, a, a baseball or a basketball or something, and it traumatized your tooth and the nerve inside of that pulp dies and the tooth discolors. And so the dentist will go in and they'll make a little hole in the tooth and they will pull that nerve tissue out and fill it with a filling material. So that tooth will no longer have any pain. It will no longer have any life supply either. This next um, slide in 14 is a picture of a radiograph to show you um, the enamel and the dentin and the pulp. I don't know if you looked at any radiographs yet in radiography. Have you? No. Okay, so this is a bite wing radiograph. Um, the way you can um, look at it is the enamel is the outermost surface. It's the really bright white part of the tooth on the top. That's the enamel surface. That lighter gray shade underneath that is the dentin, and the really dark stuff in the middle is the pulp. And then along the way, you have junctions between the, as it transitions from those um, three different minerals. So then we have surrounding the tooth is the peri, oh, let me go back to that x-ray for a second. All of that white, grayish, hazy stuff on the bottom is all the bone. That's what supports your teeth. Um, it shows you a dark line around the root of the tooth, which is your periodontal ligament, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. But that's a very important part when you're in perio. So you that'll be like something really important to you someday, but just not today. Um, so then we're going to look at the periodontium. Um, the periodontium is the tissue that supports the tooth. It's what keeps the tooth in its socket. So you have alveolar bone or bone that houses the tooth and you have a tooth that sits in the middle. The tooth and the bone are not connected to each other. The tooth does not sit directly in the bone. There are ligaments and spaces around the tooth. That's um, the ligaments act as like a little shock absorber for the tooth. So that's how when you like take a piece of French bread or something and you torque your teeth or a bagel and you pull to the side. And sometimes your teeth will be a little sore after a while from doing that. That's those ligaments around the tooth. They're what allow the tooth to have just a little bit of give. So when you, if you press on your teeth, there's actually a little bit of movement. You do not feel it because it's so slight, but there's actually a little bit of movement around it. And that's because it has ligaments. That's how your joints move. That's how your teeth move. Um, so they sit inside the bone with these ligament attachments, and then you've got your gum tissue around that. And we talked a little bit yesterday in or the other day and had an neck anatomy about gum tissue. And here's the gum tissue again, now called gingiva. So your gingiva 
is divided into layers and you can see really clearly in that picture where your attached gingiva is that really hard pink stuff. And hopefully you all went home and looked in the mirror um, in the last couple of nights and looked at your own gums or gingiva and you could see that pink, that light pink and firm looking tissue and you could see the free gingiva or the marginal gingiva. That's where your um, gum and your teeth meet. And if you notice in that picture, um, it's a nice, pretty round arch. And when you smile, you probably all have those nice, pretty round arches. And then on the far right, you can see the interdental papilla, the space or the uh, teeth, um, the gingiva that fills the spaces between the teeth. If you took that away, you'd have space between your teeth. Questions? Um, we have terms for describing the crowns and the roots. There's the anatomic crown and root and the clinical crown and root. The anatomic or anatomy crown and root, um, the crown is the part that's covered with enamel. The root is the part that's covered with cementum. So any tooth you were to look at, no matter where it is, an extracted tooth or in a mouth, the anatomical crown is the part that has the enamel on it. And the anatomical root is the part that has cementum on it. And underneath both of those is dent. The clinical crown is the part of the tooth that you see in the mouth. And the clinical root is the part of the tooth that you don't see. So that's probably seems a little confusing, but if a patient has recession as like in the top picture there, that patient has a lot of recession on that tooth. The anatomic crown stays the same, no matter where the position of the gum is. The anatomic crown is the part that's covered with enamel. But the clinical crown, the part you actually see, now becomes the whole tooth to, to the gum line. So even though those are roots that you see, that's considered your clinical crown. And it works the same way when you are looking at um, people who have um, a lot of gum tissue. The clinical crown is the part you see, but the anatomic crown, the enamel, might go underneath the gum a little bit, like in that picture. Sometimes you see people smile and they have what we call a gummy smile. I'm sure some of you have seen that. Um, they have more enamel underneath all that gum tissue. It's just the gums are not positioned where you would ideally want them to be. And there's a procedure that can be done where in a perio office where they will actually cut that gum tissue off so that you can see more of the clinical or more of the anatomic crowns. So that because it looks prettier. It's called crown or uh, gingivectomy. And there's just a little cartoon for you. And we'll go through just a couple more slides and then we'll take a break. Does that sound good? Yep. yep. All right. So terminology to identify the surfaces of the teeth. So now we're going to look at the actual teeth. And this is important that we learn these terms because like I said, probably next week you're going to start with some of your probing and your instrumentation. Maybe not next week, maybe the following week. But either way, you're going to need to know these pretty soon. You have anterior teeth. Your anterior teeth are your central incisors on the top and the bottom, and your lateral incisors on the top of the bottom, and your canines. Those are your anterior teeth. Basically, they're the ones that are covered by your lips. So when you are talking about um, teeth that those particular 12 teeth, the six on the top and the six on the bottom, you can use labial as your term to describe the front surfaces of them. You can also use facial. That's not incorrect. So, but labial is more correct. Your posterior teeth are all the rest of your teeth. They consist of your two premolars in each quadrant and your three molars in each quadrant. So that's the remaining 20 of your teeth there. 
and um, on the, they're called your posterior teeth. And for those teeth, you use the term buckle because they face the buckle region of your face. You can also use facial for those um, surfaces. That would not be incorrect, but buckle is a better descriptor. Maxillary teeth. On the insides of all of your maxillary teeth, because they face toward the palate, you can call them the lingual or you can call them at the palatal side. Either one is correct. But on the mandibular teeth, it's just going to be lingual. Anterior teeth have what we call incisal edges. Remember, they're the ones that incise. Um, and posterior teeth have occlusal surfaces. So the posterior teeth have an actual full surface where the anterior teeth just have the edges. So they have an incisal edge or an occlusal surface. Then you have your mesial surfaces. Your mesial surfaces are proximal surfaces that face the midline of an arch. So this is kind of hard to visualize, but basically we always just kind of say they're the front surfaces. So as your teeth are sitting in their arch, like they should be, they would be the surfaces facing this way. They're all on both the top and the bottom. Um, some people like to refer to them as the surfaces closer to the front. Some people call them the closer to the anterior, but those are your mesial surfaces and they are between the teeth. So on every tooth, the, the surface that's closest to the next tooth in front of it is the mesial surface. And then your distal surfaces are the opposite side. They're the ones that face away from you or away from the front. Those are the distal surfaces. From now on, you will always use the term mesial or distal when you're describing something. Proximal is a generic term for any of those surfaces when you're talking to a patient or when you're talking um, just kind of generally in the mouth, you can say they have moderate calculus interproximal. That means in between all of their teeth or they have moderate interproximal plaque. But if you're talking about a specific surface, you'll want to say the mesial of number 12 or the distal of number 12. I think there's decay on the mesial of number five. You know, that's how you would talk about surfaces from that standpoint. Let's go ahead and take a break now for about 10 minutes and come back at 8.55, because um, now we're going to get into some stuff that's a little bit more detailed, and I want you to get a chance to stretch, get some coffee, and we'll meet back at 8.55. Sound good? Yes, thank yeah. you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, are we all back? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So now we're going to talk some more terms. Um, a lot of these terms, you don't have to memorize them. What you're going to do is you're going to break them down. Because if you, you can memorize them if you want, but it's a lot harder than just breaking them down. There are lots of things in parts of anatomy, both head and neck and um, dental anatomy, that if you break down the words, it gives you the actual definition or what you're looking at, tells you what you're looking at. So we have something called surface junctions. That's where two surfaces join, such as distolabial or mesiobuccal. Um, I'm going to um, show you what I mean by dimensions. So if I, can you see this Kleenex box in front of me? No. Yes. No, we no. have a, a yes. Yes. Oh, should I? Should I, can, I don't. Some of it. you can. Some of you can't. Can you mm -hmm. see me? No. Can you can you see me at all? No. 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 We see the PowerPoint. You're still seeing the PowerPoint. Okay. All right. I'll show you at the end then, because I don't want to close the PowerPoint. Okay. So. Um, so when you're looking at um, surface junctions, it's where two surfaces meet. So we talked about mesial, mesial, distal, buccal, and lingual. Those are the four sides of your tooth. Mesial is the one closest. Distal is the opposite or the back side of a tooth. And then buccal or labial or facial is going to be the surface facing the cheek and lip. And then, of course, you've got lingual. We don't usually use the palatal word when we're describing. So we've got those four sides. Think of the tooth as like a cube and you've got a front, a back and two sides. So when we are um, doing surface junctions, we're going to do where two surfaces meet. So if you've got the mesial surface meeting with the buccal surface on a molar, we're going to call that mesio buccal. So we're going to change the IAL to just an IO, mesio buccal. Or you could have disto buccal or distal lingual. And it would be with the joint where the two meet. So if you picture even like your room, the corners are the, the surface junctions. So you'll have the mesial wall and the buccal wall in that corner where they meet is the mesial buckle. And then um, we can divide the crowns in the roots into thirds. So if you had the same tooth, that same square or you, your same um, model, if you divided it, you could divide it into thirds. So you've got the mesial third which is the front third of the tooth. You've got the middle third, which would be the whole middle of the tooth. And then you've got the distal third. So when you're taking measurements with your probe, you're going to take a mesial measurement, you're going to take a middle measurement, and you're going to take a distal me measurement on the buckle. And then you're going to take those same three measurements on the lingual. So that's how we're going to apply this when, real quickly here when you start learning your probe. So you're going to be probing the mesial, the middle, and the distal. And then you can also divide the tooth into layers, transverse layers or horizontal layers. So you would have the um, occlusal or incisal third. You would have the middle third. And then you would have what we call the cervical third. And that's the part that comes closest to the gum. The cervical third is the part that's closest to the gingiva. The occlusal or incisal third is the part that you're going to use to chew or bite with. And then the middle's just the middle. So we can basically break that crown into nine different sections. Three sections this way, and three sections this way. 
like a tic-tac-toe board. Or are you guys too young? You remember tic-tac-toe, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good, thank you. I'm showing my age, sorry. Okay, root to crown ratio. This is kind of a complicated thing. You probably um, don't need to know that much about it. Just know it exists. There is something called a root to crown ratio. Um, different teeth have a different ratio. So if you look at those two pictures, um, the first one on the left is a canine tooth and if you look at the bottom part, the crown part, compared to how long the root is, and the tooth next to it is an incisor, the crown is almost as long as the root. That's called the root to crown ratio. And that makes a difference um, in occlusion and in restorative, um, in perio, depending on how much bone loss there is. Um, kind of gives them some idea of how stable a tooth is going to be. Um, for purposes of the class, just know that there is a root to crown ratio and that the, um, let's see, the larger ratio denotes a relatively larger root compared to the crown. And We're not actually going to calculate. I'm sorry, what? And these measurements are in millimeters? Yes, they are in millimeters. We measure almost everything in millimeters. Millimeters are pretty tiny. Um, we have now in dentistry a lot of like 3D um, scanners and 3D x-rays that we can take and they measure them by like the quarter millimeter. But um, for, for our purposes, we're usually use, using millimeters. So terms that describe a tooth itself, you have what we call cusps. Your back or molar teeth and your premolar teeth have cusps. The cusp is a rounded pyramid shape with four ridges. So think of kind of like a mountain. A cusp is like a mountain. It has a, a peak or a top part and then it kind of flows and gets wider as it goes down. And it, they have ridges just like mountains have ridges. Um, so, of course, every cusp has a mesial cusp ridge, a distal cusp ridge, a buccal cusp ridge, and a triangular ridge. Do not worry right now about memorizing those. Just for now, let's go with the cusp. And these are some pictures of your cusps and how they're named. Right now, we're not going to memorize all the cusp names. You will in, as we go along, but cusp ridges are linear bulges or prominences of enamel converging toward the tip. So in other words, the tip of the cusp is the very top. And there are um, bulges that of enamel that converge toward the cusp tip. And then you have something called a cingulum. If you take your tongue and you touch the backs of your upper front teeth, Start from the incisal edge and slide your tongue up to the to the gingiva. You can feel how it bulges out right before the, the gingiva. Can anybody everybody feel that? You can do it on your incisors or your canines. But feel how it starts out flat and then it kind of bulges right before you hit the, the margin of the gingiva. That's called your cingulum. And you have them on incisors and canines. And then you have something called marginal ridges. They form the mesial and distal borders of the lingual surface and converge toward the cingulum on anterior teeth. And they form the mesial and distal borders of the occlusal surface on posterior teeth. So that's a lot of words. Let me, um, I'll show you that one later on a, on a model, what it would look like. And actually, we'll probably look at these when we have our little meetings on Mondays and Wednesdays, too. Um, triangular ridges. Triangular ridges are located on major cusps of posterior teeth. And they run from the cusp tip to the center fossa. So you have your cusp like this, and you have another cusp, and you have four cusps on a molar. 
let's say. So the triangular ridge starts at the top and runs to the center. So they all run and they all meet at the, and have a party in the center. So each one has like a slope. It's like if you had four mountains, each one slopes to the center. And those are your triangular ridges. And then you have something called transverse ridges. Um, so a triangular ridge that slopes down and a triangular ridge that slopes down. If you did the whole slope like this, you would have a, tra a transverse ridge. And then oblique ridges. Oblique ridges are on um, only on certain teeth and they're only on maxillary molars. That's right for now. That's all you need to remember about oblique ridges is that they're only on maxillary molars. They run obliquely or diagonally. So these are some pictures of the marginal ridges and um, the tooth on the left is an incisor tooth. And the tooth on the right is a premolar tooth. So one on the incisor tooth, we're looking at the, the back side, the lingual side or the palatal side. Um, that's the part I had you touch with your tongue. So if you look at that tooth, the little green dot at the top is the cingulum. That's right before you get to the gingival margin. It's that bulge part. And then if you looked at the mesial side of the tooth and we're on the lingual, but toward the mesial. And if you looked at the distal, those are your called your marginal ridges. When we get into class next week, like I said, I'll show you all these on models, but those are the marginal ridges. On a, a, a posterior tooth, a premolar or a molar, your marginal ridges are up on the occlusal table. And of course, one's on the mesial side, one's on the distal side. Triangular ridges, these are some pictures of triangular ridges. So if you look at the picture on the left, that's a premolar tooth. And that's the occlusal table. You're going from the cusp on um, premolar teeth have two cusps. So we're going from the cusp of one and we're going toward the center. We're going on the cusp on the lingual and we're going toward the center. Those are triangular ridges. If you went from all the way across that purple line, that would be a transverse ridge. So two triangular ridges, if you went and slid down both of those ridges, that's a transverse ridge. The picture on the bottom right is a molar tooth. And so it's kind of the same picture, but it shows you that the transverse ridge slides down the two cusps and the oblique running diagonally. When we get into studying molar teeth, we'll get more into the names of those ridges and stuff. They all have names. And by the time you get done with this class, you'll know what all those ridges names are. It's not a matter of memorizing the all these words. You'll pick the words apart. Like if you look at right there where it says mesiolingual cusp, you're going to divide that out. You're looking at the mesial lingual. And so mesial will be toward the front and it'll be on the lingual. So I'm sorry, I was looking at the model while you were talking. So I'm just trying to gather the triangular ridge. Both of them put together like that is the transverse ridge. Yes. Okay. So you guys have seen like pictures of people skateboarding and they skateboard down one ramp and up like down and up the other side of the ramp. Can you Maybe. picture that? Okay. So imagine that those two peaks of the ramp are the cusps and you slide down one and you slide down the other. If you slid all the way across and from down one side and up the other, that would be the transverse. Okay. Each one sliding down to the center is its own triangular ridge, but if you slid the whole thing, that's a transverse ridge. Um, as far as, um, ridges on the outsides of the teeth. 
Let's not worry about this slide right now. Don't worry about slide 31. Mammalons and perichia, perichiamata. Mammalons are on um, teeth. They help the teeth erupt. If you look at those pictures on the incisal edges of those teeth, they have bumps. They're not flat across. If if you've ever looked at, if you have children and they've just recently gotten their, their um, incisor teeth in, you will see those bumps. Those bumps are what help the, the tooth break through the tissue to erupt. If you look at um, permanent teeth, like if you all smiled and looked in the mirror now, some of you might still see a little bit of those ridges because they haven't worn away yet in time. But by the time, most of the time, by the time you're an adult, those ridges have been worn off just from chewing and talking and all that kind of stuff. And the teeth look pretty, pretty much flat, which is probably how most of your teeth look right now. Um, that's perfectly normal. And then the t picture on the right is something called perichiamata. There are little white, if you look really closely at that picture, there are little tiny wavy like white lines across those teeth. And those are um, part of the um, enamel layers. When you when the teeth erupt, you sometimes can see those still, but in time they kind of disappear. Just like the mammalons, just from exposure, they disappear. Um, sulcus, I told you um, when we talked about the sulcus in um, head and neck anatomy, the sul sulcus is kind of a general term for a depression. Um, you have a sulcus in the occlusal surface of your teeth. It's where the, um, the center like groove is down a molar tooth. And there's just a little dental humor. Grooves, so we have grooves in our teeth. Your molar teeth have lots of grooves. Your premolars have some grooves, your molars have lots of grooves. As we go through this course, we will learn how all of those grooves have names. Again, you're not going to have to memorize their names because you're going to be able to break down the words and figure out what we're talking about. Um, and you'll see as we go through these classes, the first couple of chapters, a pattern in how we do this and it'll be it'll seem a lot I don't want to say easy but it'll make a lot more sense I know this right now seems like a whole lot of words but when I say you'll you'll know all these grooves you won't have to sit down and memorize 50 terms you'll be able to look at the word and break it apart and know exactly where we are so you have major grooves or developmental grooves these are in your teeth as they form you have them in in your uh, molar teeth. We call them major grooves because there's a lot of minor grooves too, or supplemental grooves. Some people have more than others, but we almost all have all the major developmental grooves. We just don't always have all the minor supplemental grooves. Um, they are named for the surface or line angle they aim toward. So think of an arrow. The name is going to be named toward what you're pointing to with the arrow. So another, and then you have something called fossa. Fossa are little, are smaller round depressions or saucer-like depressions. And a lot of times they're at the bottom of grooves. So you'll have a groove and it'll go into like a Think of like water flowing and it goes into a pond and that's the fossa. And oftentimes a fossa will have a pit at the bottom of it. Pits are where we get tooth decay. Pits are what we seal when we're trying to prevent tooth decay and you're going to do sealants in clinic. Um, so we're trying to keep those pits, um, keep food and debris gets into the fossas, we're trying to keep the pits from decaying. Maxillary canines may have two lingual fossa separated, separated by a lingual ridge. So there's a lingual ridge and again, um, 
like I said, once you get the basic terminology down, we know a ridge is um, forms like a, a hill almost. And um, on the lingual, it would be on the lingual. If you take your tongue and you touch the back of your canine tooth, you can a lot of times feel that little ridge. You can definitely see it, but sometimes you can even feel it, or a lot of times you can even feel it with your tongue. Pits, pits are often found within fossa. So the pits are usually at the bottom. Kind of think of it almost like a drain or a sink, and um, you've got the, the water coming down into the fossa or into the drain area, and then when it actually sent the center of the drain is the pit. Incisors um, have one broad shallow fossa. You can feel it with your tongue. If you rub your tongue, especially on your lateral incisors, if you rub your tongue back there, you can feel it. Um, and premolars, if you take your tongue on one of your premolars, you can usually feel the anatomy on your premolars, but we're going to look at all of these in actual teeth. So then there's junctions within your root anatomy and your tooth anatomy. Junctions are where two surfaces meet. So your CEJ is a really big one that we need to know about. So if you look at this picture on slide 40, your CEJ is your cemento enamel junction. It's where the cementum and the enamel meet. It's called the CEJ. And usually um, with an instrument, you can feel that, that, that division. It's usually one sticks out a little farther, one dips in the, a, a little bit farther, so you can feel it with an instrument. It's what complicates our lives as hygienists, is the CEJ. And it complicates our lives because it sticks out just a little bit. So when you're trying to feel calculus and you're just learning, you can't tell most of the time if you're on the CEJ or actual calculus. So with time and scaling lots of teeth, you will learn to determine the difference between the CEJ and calculus and how they feel. But right now you won't, and that's okay. Um, the top part is enamel, the bottom part's the cementum, CEJ is where they meet. And then you can see you've got the apex of the root. And then on multi-rooted teeth or teeth that have more than one root, you will have something called a furcation. It's where the two roots separate. This next slide on 41, it gives you some just some data out of your dental anatomy book. It just tells you which ones are the longest or the widest or the narrowest of all your teeth. Eventually you will know this. Um, your CEJ goes around the tooth. So it's not just on the buccal or lingual, it goes all the way around the tooth. It's where the enamel and the cementum meet all the way around the sides of the tooth. It is wavy. It is not a continuous circle. It's located in different places on different teeth. And as we go through each type of tooth, incisors, canines, premolars, and molars, we will talk about where that CEJ is. That CEJ is so important to know when you're a hygienist, because like I said, it's going to make your life difficult at first when you're trying to scale. But as you combine some of your knowledge of where the CEJ is located, that will help you differentiate between calculus and CEJ. We do not expect you to be able to do that in term four or even term five. It's all a learning process, um, trying to figure out, and sometimes, even on a lot of people, you, all the way through your career, you're still struggling trying to figure out where exactly is the CEJ on a person. But um, for the most part, we're going to learn how to where the CEJ should be on a tooth, and that will help guide you through what you're feeling when you're actually in the mouth. Um, the mid-root axis line 
you're going to hear this a lot of times when you're talking this term when you're talking about um, teeth and scaling and things like that. So the mid root axis or long axis is if you go straight up and down or divide the root in half. Now the long axis or the mid root axis line on a tooth because your teeth don't sit in your mouth absolutely straight up and down can vary a little bit. But when we're teaching when Professor Ramos is teaching you instrumentation. She's going to use the term long axis of the tooth a lot. There's something called height of contour. Um, the height of contour is where the greatest bulge is on a tooth. So um, as you can tell just from looking at and feeling your own teeth, they're not perfectly flat. They're sort of rounded. And they different teeth like premolars and molars have their rounded part, their most rounded part in different locations. That is designed by nature to help guide food. And if you look at that picture on 44, or slide 44, the picture on the left is it is it perfect um, shape of a tooth. And that's the way it, that's a lower first premolar. And it's shaped so that when the top tooth comes down and is chewing, it's pushing the food off of the bottom tooth away from the gum. If you look at the tooth on the right, the, that tooth is shaped just slightly differently. It's a little bit more narrow and not as much curve. When that person chews, that top tooth is driving the food right down under the gum. And so that can cause gum problems. That's why when you're um, having a crown placed by your dentist, it's important that they contour that crown just perfectly. Otherwise, when you chew, it's going to be driving food down into your gum. And you've all, those of you who have been dental assistants, you've probably heard patients complain about that. I get this food stuck in my teeth here. So the contour of the tooth dictates where or how the food flows off of your teeth. Contact areas, contact areas are where teeth contact each other. So if you look at um, your teeth, they all contact each other or they should. If they don't, you'll get food stuck between them. Um, they contact each other in different places. And so we'll learn where those contacts are supposed to be. If they don't contact, food will get wedged between them. And so when a patient complains, I get food stuck between these teeth. The first thing you'll want to do is take a piece of floss and see if the teeth contact. When you are flossing your teeth and you're wiggling your teeth through that area where the teeth touch, that's the contact point. If the teeth don't touch, the floss will just pop right in and out, but so will food. And so that's why um, it's important that your teeth contact each other. A diastema is a space between teeth in the same arch. It does not include missing teeth. So if you look at those pictures on slide 46, those teeth have what we call a diastema. You can see the space between the front teeth. Sometimes that can be caused by the frenum attachment being in the wrong place and pulling those teeth apart. Um, slide 47 is just a picture the, that shows you where the, the red lines show you where the contact points are supposed to be on every tooth. We are when we learn the teeth, we will memorize where the contact points are. But for purposes of this lecture, it's just to show you that these teeth contact. And if you notice on the top picture, the far left tooth is your central incisor. The next one is your lateral canine and so on back. The farther back you go, the higher up the on the tooth the contact point is. So your molars actually contact closer to the gum line than your incisors do. Just the way that nature designed them.
And if you look at the bottom picture, the central incisors on the lower arch contact almost right at the top. That's why people who grind their teeth and have flattened off the top, they can hardly get floss between their two front teeth because the contact is right there. And so it's really hard to wiggle floss between them. And slide 48 is kind of like an aerial view. If you were looking down at the occlusal surfaces, you will notice that the red lines, the contact points as you go back farther, are more toward the buckle. So the top of the picture would be the buckle, the bottom of the picture would be the lingual. The right side would be the distal and the left side's the mesial. Does everybody have that direction okay? And so all, I'm, all they're illustrating here is that the red lines show that the farther back you go, the closer to the buckle are the contact points. We will learn where those contact points are too in each chapter or each for each type of tooth. Embrasure spaces are the spaces that are between teeth. So um, if you don't have, if your teeth have an open contact or they don't touch each other, then you don't have embrasure spaces. You also won't have interdental papilla if your teeth don't touch each other. So you have four embrasure spaces. You have a facial, a lingual, an occlusal or incisal, and a cervical or interproximal space. Um, this is just to show you that you have these embrasure spaces around the teeth. When we go through each chapter, we will talk about how big these embrasure spaces are. Why do you care? These Knowing where these spaces are will help you when you're scaling. Because when you're scaling, you need to reach those instruments in some tiny spaces. And so you want to find the the biggest space you can reach your instrument in so you have the most amount of room to work. So knowing where those spaces are and where they're bigger is going to help you. Ideal occlusion. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit about occlusion here. You are going to cover occlusion in probably every one of your classes. So um, your occlusion is the way your teeth um, are in relationship to each other when they're closed together. So um, we do them by classes and it's called angles class because angle is probably the person who came up with this um, classification system. So you're going to have angle class one, angle class two, or angle class three. There are three ways basically that your teeth can bite, bite together. Angle class one in your relationship is when the maxillary first molar fits into the mesiobuccal groove of the mandibular first molar. You will not really completely understand this until we look at molars. So I'm just introducing this to you right now. I'm not going to ask you specific detailed questions on your quiz or anything about this until we get to the chapter about occlusion and we know more about occlusion. But for now, there's it's called angles classification. There's one, two, and three. Class one is perfect. In class two, uh, this is a picture of um, perfect occlusion. Oh, and another joke. Um, so when we get into the chapters on occlusion, we will look at what's perfect. Class one is considered perfect occlusion, but we'll talk about what class two and what class three are and how to look at them. You're going to cover that in Professor Ramos's class two pretty quickly here um, because it's part of your data collection. And so when um, when you are learning about data in her class within the next few weeks, she'll talk a little bit about occlusion too. but. Um, we'll and she'll give you some diagrams so you can have them at your chair side in clinic to look at um, to put in your clinic binder. So um, we'll learn a lot about occlusion though, but just for now, just the basic. 
Um, and then tooth development developed from lobes. So when teeth are forming, they form in lobes. So each of your teeth has a different number, or many of your teeth have different numbers of lobes. As we go through the teeth, we will memorize which ones have how many lobes. Um, anterior teeth form from four lobes, three on the facial and one on the lingual. So if you look at that back at that picture we looked at with the mammalons, let me see if I can find it. So the picture with the mammalons, if you look at those teeth, those incisor teeth, they each have three mammalons. The mammalons correspond with the lobes. So when you're looking at the front of the teeth and you see three mammalons, the front teeth have three lobes. They developed from those three lobes and the mammalons guide them into the gum tissue. And then the fourth one is a cingulum, is the cingulum. Remember on the back of the tooth, you had something called a cingulum. That is your fourth lobe. So anterior teeth form from four lobes. That's the case with all of your anterior teeth. So your upper and lower central incisors, your upper and lower lateral incisors, and your upper and lower canines, all four from four lobes. Premolars and molars form from three lobes on the, or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Premolars form from three lobes on the facial, so just like your anterior teeth, and then they have one lobe for the lingual cusp. Now, Lower premolars can have two lingual cusps. We're not going to worry about that for now. When we get into premolars, we will learn that. And then your molars just form from one, um, one lobe per cusp. So if you have four cusps, you have four lobes. If you have five cusps, you have five lobes. The questions on the quiz will not be that complicated. It would probably be, possibly be, um, about an anterior tooth and know that the anterior teeth form from four lobes, three on the facial, one on the lingual. The lingual one is the cingulum. So that was kind of a lot of material. We're gonna, your quiz for this chapter is not gonna be until next Thursday. So when we are in um, our lab time on Monday and Wednesday, we will get out some teeth and we will look at teeth and hopefully this will make more sense. Um, so I would review the PowerPoints and um, review the, the those parts in the textbook. The textbook had a lot more detail and a lot more stuff. This is the stuff you need to know right here. Um, we will continue to build on this, but like I said, this is your foundation. This is your terminology. So once you get this terminology down, the rest of it's just going to be applying it to each tooth. This is basically like a lot of it in a nutshell. And we'll learn how to apply all this terminology to the different types of teeth. Does anybody have questions?